is up, what is up? It is your boy, the Reformed Christian Apologist, and I am here with another episode of Theological Discussion. Now then, let's get down to the business. Let's get down to what's going on today here in the studio, and let's discuss something that has been on my mind for quite some time, and I've been wanting to get to it. Um, and that is this one issue about a person that, you know, I want to try to hopefully... Who knows, maybe we can get her on the show, but until then, I still want to also review what's been said here um, in these articles. Um, as well as we poss- we're also going to do, a before we even get to that, we'll get to some books I got that I think are very helpful and I'd recommend to people to get. Um, for those who are familiar with the work of D.A. Carson, there is a book that I got um, for a good price during a sale that they did at ChristianBook.com called Collected Writings on Scripture by D.A. Carson. And this is a series of essays that was done by D.A. Carson concerning the theme of uh, sacred scripture itself. This was published around about 2010. And it's from Crossway as well, if you wanted to get that. It's been um, reviewed and recommended by people such as Michael S. Horton, good church history type of guy, as well as uh, J. Ligon Duncan, the senior minister in the, of the First Presbyterian Church in Jackson, Mississippi, and president of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. So this is a good book to have. It's a uh, not too long of a read, really, and it's uh, you don't have to read it like a book. You just go through the essays, of which goes about recent developments in the doctrine of Scripture, um, going over the different... Uh, liberal theories and such that uh, exist in the church today. Um, I forget what form of a criticism that he goes over in the uh, in the work, but there's a, fo- there's a form of criticism that's been used that can be used uh, in a good light if you're using the conservative method of scholarship, but at the same time there's also a uh, usage of it in which one pretty much will just criticize the text and not even try to actually extract anything from it in general um so it's got five it's got a few chapters on how to approach the bible and how to interpret it in light of different theories that are coming out in the doctrine of studying scripture as well as several book reviews like the reviews that he's doing in this is of william j abrams abraham's the Divine Inspiration of Holy Scripture, James Barr's The Scope and Authority of the Bible, and I. Howard Marshall's Biblical Interpretation, along with um, a critical review of John Webster's Holy Scripture, A Dogmatic Sketch, Peter N.'s Inspiration and Incarnation, Evangelicals and the Problem of the Old Testament, (laughs) as well as N.T. Wright, The Last Word, Beyond the Bible Wars to a New Understanding of the Authority of Scripture as well as even reviewing some books such as Jeffrey L. Scheller's Is the Bible True? How Modern Debates and Discoveries Affirm the Essence of Scripture, and so on and so on. So it's got plenty of good essays. It's a good price. It's a good read. Um, I would recommend this to anyone who is um, doing an examination and is studying upon the scriptures. Next is a book that I got from uh, Books A Million. Um, is called A Dictionary of Early Christian Beliefs by David W. Burcott, uh, who is the editor of the book. And it's a very well exhaustive uh, book. It has up to 700 pages of various um, Bible quotes concerning certain topics, such as, for example, the days of creation, clothing, uh, churches, Christianity, the divinity of Christ, celibacy, discrimination, all these other subjects, and along with the Bible verses, it also quotes early church fathers um, and what they viewed of the subject. So in other words, if you wanted to see what they thought about sola fide and see the early church fathers who affirmed justification by faith alone, you can go to that part. Then if you want to see the ones who affirmed uh, sola scriptura, and how they viewed scripture, you can go to the part on scripture. Um, then, of course, the differing views on the Eucharist. They have a section there about the Eucharist, and that not everyone was exactly um, in line with how Rome viewed it. It even has it separated in two 
into like uh, seven things, such as the doctrine of the Eucharist, how the Eucharist was celebrated, the letters of the communion, the Eucharist as a spiritual sacrifice, other spiritual sacrifices, other interpretations of body and blood, as well as unworthy participation. So they have seven different sections that they cut this up in, and it goes pages on and pages on as to the church father quotations and then using the Bible to also reveal this because early church also relies in the historical eyewitness accounts of the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts. So they have to be consistent with the conservative scholarship that we utilize in affirming not only just that history, but also the history of the New Testament, especially within the book of Acts. Now then, the book, the books that I've mentioned here, um, those are some things I've got, and I hope they can be utilized perfectly in the future for upcoming debates, as well as research for more videos. But <clears throat> I want to get onto this uh, person get on this one video that I had uh, or not video but rather article that I have talked about wanting to do and it's been on my mind for a while because when I because here's a background first um, I had first heard of this person from a guy uh, named Steve McRae I believe is who kind of introduced it, me to the person and especially by the time they made that whole you know questions no Christian can answer video for the non sequitur show when that came out you know people were jumping ready to jump on that and try to see how to answer it um, to the best of their abilities um, when when that started I was probably one of the first to really actually make a response as well as get to work on it because what happened was that when I saw that it came out um, which was what May 1st I started immediately working on a script and listening to the video back and forth back and forth and back and forth to make sure it was able to accurately represent the other person's positions correctly and on that um, I saw that you know it took me a, a, about a short amount of time and concerning three days because mine got published on May the 4th so, you know, it was the whole Star Wars, may the fourth be with you kind of thing. So, that I made my video and had it uh, published so that people could see it. Um, so, I did that, but I think it was either before, like the day before or after, um, that I was asked to, um, if these people uh, wanted or if I wanted to join these people in a article that they did um, they were going to do like this whole collaboration of other Christians join up and do the article on uh, against each answers and I said no um, and the reason why was because one I did not know this person at the time I really just don't accept things by you know word anymore when someone just simply says they're Christian I have to examine, and I could have done that, but it's still at the same time, it was either because I had already made one, and I mean, I've already said my piece, and I've already done what I needed to do, or I was in the middle of it, and I wasn't going to just try to be everywhere. I was going to stick to one thing and one thing alone, and so when I did this, um, I'm kind of now... I'm even more glad that I kind of said no because once I saw the article was published, which was about two days after mine was, uh, which was May 6th, um, the person calls themselves Christian Apologist on the, uh, on the internet, on, on the website of theirs, uh, which is christian-apologist.com, but they uh, is SJ Thomason on Twitter. And that's how we got into contact. And whenever I saw the article, I took a look. And needless to say, it was not the best um, article I've seen. This is not the article I'm talking about. Um, we're going to another one. But this is just a background to show what exactly is going on and why I have worries and why this person definitely needs critique. Is because one, the people that were on this panel or on this uh, list of people that were compiling up the articles 
Um, some I don't even know about because there's really not much info I can have. And to me, I will not do that unless I have every single bit of information. I will not be on something unless I know what I'm, who I'm working with, what are their beliefs, because if I end up working with somebody to write a refutation to atheism or to Islam and provide an, providing my arguments that are sola scriptura, faith alone, and Jesus alone based arguments, but if I got people who are going to be um, people who are of the Roman Catholic or the Eastern Orthodox perspective, I will not do it. Because I believe that that's a false gospel. And I believe if I was able to be on that and I knew of who was specifically on there, I would have asked, okay, I'll do it on one condition. You allow me to make a distinction between these false gospels and then the true gospel of the Bible. So in other words, I would get to write what is wrong with Eastern Orthodox, and I would get to write what is wrong with Roman Catholicism. I would get to do that. However, again, I wasn't going to waste my time at the, at the point. But if I hadn't have made or even made plans to make another one of these videos in which I was responding to them, I probably would have joined and made those demands. But even then, I imagine you, I would have probably been kicked out because these are people that I've known that, you know, a lot of people cling to. Like, it's like an idol almost to them to the point that it's like, oh, this person's like the destroyer of atheism. Among whom is uh, Eve Kananian, or however you pronounce it, Kananian, Kananian, I don't know how you say it, um, who recently blocked me on Twitter um, because I had called her out on her cowardice when it comes to how she rants and rambles engaging with the atheists and that that seems to be what she's focused on and not preaching a gospel message or engaging in an apologetic that's equivalent to the concept of witnessing but rather it's uh, you're st you're dumb you're this you're so foolish la da la da la I don't do that whenever I start making these certain things now I might get act in political at times and that may come out but concerning that that's politics that's not the same thing as when you are trying to engage in a false religion that you believe is wrong and then when it comes to trying to convert the person to Christ then engaging in something that reflects the gospel that reflects how Christ is and that is what the Bible commands us to do that we are to reflect God that we are to have a mirroring of Christ in us. But, but So you have Eve that blocked me for that, for trying to call her out on that, as well as her Eastern Orthodox heresies, while her friends tried to tackle alongside that. There was another guy that was in there, uh, I believe his name is Andrew, uh, who is pretty much the Roman Catholic. At least I think I could be wrong, I could be wrong. But so then I look through the article for that, and I see, again, one of the problems why I would be so much against it is, especially concerning Eve's writings, it's not really a lot of Bible. It's just, uh, well, the great Alvin Plantico once said, or, um, you know, that just sounds like a foolish question, or just simple answers in which people aren't given much exposition on, when they know that's what they're going to want, exposition. When Steve McRae asks an answer, he's going to want some exposition. When the Holy Kool-Aid asks for something, he's going to want some exposition. Unless, you know, like him, he did kind of ask a silly question. But at least I tried to go over it as best as possible. So, anyways. Like, for example, in one of the questions... Um, yeah, but that's the other thing, too. They won't really go to the Bible as well unless that somebody takes them there. Like, when they mention doubting Thomas that's when they'll go there but then of course they just give their idea but that's as close you'll get to getting someone to actually quote scripture to go to the Bible and such but like for example in a biblical interpretations section the genetically modified skeptic says quote among even the most fundamental of Christians uh, there are always people who interpret some part of the Bible metaphorically or metaphysically like in the book of Job they talk about the four corners of the earth Christians, for the most part, interpret that as metaphorical because we know there are no four corners of the earth. 
So a guy named J.J. Richards just simply says the following. Hermeneutics. Like literally, everyone had, some of the people have had at least a paragraph or at least two or three paragraphs. All he said is hermeneutics. Okay. Explain. Expound upon that. But yet this person was willingly going to allow this to be published. <laughs> I mean, just, wow. Ugh. So... There's uh, some of them were actually answered in a way that I would have responded to, but it's also pretty much just not really good apologetics. It's not really good answers, and not everyone gets to answer the questions. It seems because Eve doesn't answer every single one of them, but she, it's like they're assigned to specific ones that are dealing with their strengths and weaknesses. I didn't do that. I answered all of them to my best ability and had to go do the research edit the video for quite some period of time and then post it on the internet while trying to make sure that all the links and sources are provided. <sighs> all right. Now to go to the article itself that we're actually going over and that is can good people of, of, of faiths other than Christianity receive salvation? So I thought that you know her interacting with these people was bad enough that you know it was just gonna be dabbling with heresies <laughs> sorry for that I had to blow my nose real quick but uh what happens is that I, from what I read from what I read this sounds like a universal salvationist kind of person and we'll get to the bottom of why where the problem is with this so this is from uh, her article that's only on the, if you go to the website, the article is under a thing called, Sal the section called Salvation, so you click on that. This is really probably the only article there. This was published on September the 4th, 2017. <coughs> and this is why not only will I not work with this person in, in the future unless they repent of this, but I will not be associated with anything that this person does in any way, fashion, or form concerning a apologetic of defending the Christian faith because I'm going to say, okay, y'all may have a point in certain aspects concerning what y'all, what you atheists affirm, but I'm also going to say this, do not affirm what this woman believes. Do not affirm what she believes because she believes in a false gospel. She believes in false teaching. That's what I would go about doing alongside it. Now, I could have a talk with the person. I have no problem with that and still be, you know, have conversations or even be friends. But as far as trying to work together as supposed ambassadors for Christ and to be evangelists or apologists together, no. Because we obviously have two different faiths. We have to believe in two different Jesuses. We believe in two different concepts of Christianity. And I will not align my cause of Christianity with hers. So, that being said, let's take a look at the article in which it starts here. Quote, One of my Muslim colleagues invited me and the family to his home for dinner for a short while back. When we arrived, we were shocked at the generous volume of food that he and his wife had spent the entire day preparing. I've never seen so much food prepared for only six people to eat. There were platters of beef, chicken, spaghetti, vegetables, desserts, and more. My family and I were very impressed with their hospitality, and we came to develop a new respect for their culture that night. My friend shared much information about his religion and beliefs, and I saw him and his wife, the presence of much piety, respect, and obedience, and love for Allah. A few weeks ago, another colleague and I carpooled to a work event. I discovered during our ride that he is a very faithful believer in Hinduism. Like my Muslim friend who loves Allah, he very much loves his gods, plural, and he prays to them daily. Do their prayers go unanswered? Do good people of other faiths achieve salvation? A friend on social media named Renee expressed a similar concern. So while she then reads the uh, blog article in which it's from this person that expresses a concern, listen to how she responds. And I at least admire her when she uh, goes as far as to quote scripture, and that is... Um, you know, John chapter 14, verse 6, which is the one that we use that is the truth. 
that mentions who Jesus is and the fact that he is the way, in which it says, she said this, quote, Jesus Christ stated, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. Many Christians believe that if one does not believe in Jesus by the day they die, that he or she will go to hell. Other Christians, such as C.S. Lewis, feel that people will have the option to follow Jesus even after they die. If the former is true, such implications would apply to billions of people who walked on the earth prior to Jesus' arrival and to billions who have lived since in places in which other faiths practiced. That would mean that billions of faithful, consensuous, good-hearted people who happen to be born in the wrong place at the wrong time are destined for hell. Not necessarily, because the issue then still goes to, let's go to the before, before Jesus. Because there are a lot of apologists, which I'm surprised you haven't looked, listened to these guys on it, like, you know, Sean McDowell, um, I believe there was even one guy, I uh, forget what his name is, um, Chris White, um, who made a video about, you know, what about those who have not heard, you know, there's many topics that deal with the issue of what happened to those who believe before. The issue is that these people before were in this place called Sheol, and it still exists today. The Sheol, which is divided into two sections, the righteous and the wicked. We see this in an illustration when we go to the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus goes to the component of Sheol that is for the righteous. So he's in Sheol, and so is the rich man, but the rich man is in a place where the wicked go. It's not fire and brimstone, but there, one suffers, the other is in paradise. And as they're in this, Jesus, when he dies, he goes to Sheol, where the righteous are, and then declares the gospel to them, and then they ascend with him into heaven, so that those who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life in Christ and will be in heaven. Because now, since Jesus has come, paradise has already moved on to being in heaven and not in Sheol. While those who are wicked go to Sheol, and then when the time of judgment has come, they will be cast into the lake of fire, which is hell, which again, still not, you know, the whole concept of it being on fire and everything. <sighs> Man, I've got to probably check out what, what's causing me to yawn these days. Um, but yeah, like, point being is that there's still a punishment, an eternal punishment, Jesus talks about it um, quite clearly. In fact, even as a Timothy Keller once said, Jesus talks about hell more than anybody in the Bible. Because as he says, listen to this, verse 13, started in Matthew chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the, and the road is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. Meaning there's multiple ways to get through this gate of destruction, referring to hell. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. So then there's the narrow gate, only in Christ, and difficult is the road that leads to it, to life, to eternal life, and there's few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous, ravaging wolves. We won't get that far, but point is, then it goes on, and people were talking about then the goods and the bad fruits. You can determine them by their fruits. And so it says for not, verse 19, Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So a tree that produces bad fruit and doesn't produce good fruit, it is cut down and is casted into the lake of fire. Therefore, by your fruits shall you know them. That's where the verse then talks about this whole thing about the fruits. And then it says in verse 21, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done so many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. You workers of iniquity. Now, a lot of people, now as the person has tried to say then C.S. Lewis believed in something which I disagree with. Um, that is that they'll have the option to follow Jesus after they die. One, where is that in the Bible that they will have the option to follow after Jesus when they die? Secondly, is 
uh, if that's the case, then how do you deal with eternal um, punishment? That is literally the passages that we read of in Scripture. They speak of the eternal punishment of God upon wicked sinners. Some verses I will pull up for this. <coughs> And I want to make sure that I use the, and this is just something I prefer, but either way, you can look this up anywhere else. In the King James Bible, it says in Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So you have to see that this punishment is everlasting. It is eternal. It does not cease. So in other words, they can. if you want to say they choose God, then you must say and that if they go to heaven, that they all of a sudden lose um, this everlasting punishment. That the punishment is no longer everlasting, and this punishment is no longer eternal. It is none of these things. But I don't believe that. I don't believe this at all. Anyways, going on, she says, Does that seem logical or fair? Is that really what the Bible says? Why would a loving God punish the innocent in such a cruel way? Um, simple, because the Bible says this, that, you know, the Bible is true, and that God is not just a loving God, but he's also a just God. He is also a, a God of wrath and of anger. So he doesn't say that he's completely loving and void of every other single um, emotion. It describes the attributes of God quite clearly. And if you read the Old Testament, you'll find this. Unless you want to say the Old Testament God is different than the New Testament one, which in that case you would be preaching a dualism, of preaching a Gnosticism at that point. So she also tries to say, is it logical or fair? Again, logical or fair according to whom? By what standard do you determine logic and fairness? But what's your, what's your final authority? What's your standard? Is it you, the man, the human being? Or is it the Bible? Because now you're saying, then, what is that? What is that really? What the Bible says? Well, I don't know. Let's take a look. What does the Bible say? It says, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me." Meaning, no one comes to Father God except through Jesus Christ, because He is the truth, the life, and the way. Um, and the, those in John three sixteen, which a lot of people like to use for their verses, for uh, getting the emotion. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but everlasting life. Verse 18, though, says, He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So it is quite clear from the word of God that those who do not believe they stand condemned already. And that those who stand condemned, as Matthew chapter 25 says, concerning the parable mentioned there, that people who are against the word of God. People who are against Jesus do not believe in him, do not put their faith and trust in him. They will inherit eternal punishment. They will inherit eternal death. So it is through faith alone in Christ alone that it redeems. Now she goes on to say, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, which says that God is love. He desires all men to be saved and come to acknowledge, uh, come to the knowledge of the truth, which is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, 2 Peter 3, 9, which again... I've gone over these verses in one of my videos that shows that you can use these verses actually to prove Calvinism to demonstrate the issue of limited atonement, that there is a people chosen for God unto salvation and that there's others that do not receive that likewise. The point is you don't minus out these Bible verses and then go uh, try to you know throw scripture away. As in, oh, these are the verses we're going to stick with. Context and the rest of the biblical text that affirms other truths don't matter. So pretty much, let's ignore consistency. So of course she also then says John 3.16 as it to support her case when it's quite clear. It says, they shall not perish, those who believe in him. Well, that, what does that mean for those who do not believe in him? Biologic that says they'll perish. If they do not believe, they perish. But whoever believes shall not perish, but have, but have eternal life. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15, she says, explains what will occur on judgment day. It states that I saw a great white throne and 
him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens f uh, fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, and it was the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, uh, recorded in the deeds. The sea gave up the dead and were in it, and death and Hades were gave up death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. This is hell here, it is this part right here. Anyone whose name was not found in the book of life was thrown in the lake of fire. Now, she then says, We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, yet even sinners and imperfect will be welcome in heaven. Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 23 says, They will no longer defile themselves with their idols and vile images or with any of their offenses, for I will save them from all their sinful backsliding, and I will cleanse them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. So, she then says, Only God knows our hearts, so those who uh, were not positioned in a place to find Jesus are likely to be included in the book of life. Again, nowhere does the Bible say this. That's just an assumption, and that's because you can't deal with these issues in light of what the Bible says and what Christianity says, so that you have to make your own conclusions. But the issue is that while, yes, sinners are going to be in heaven, note what the Bible also says. That 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, start mentioning all these different sins that exist. Then what happens? After it says that these people who live in a lifestyle of practicing sin, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God, Verse 11 says, And such were some of you. So wait, what does that mean? Some, they, that, that was, that were some of you? You mean you're no longer that? It means you, when you, you identify or you live in the lifestyle of a sin, such as if you continuously drink, you are a drunkard. If you continuously uh, steal, you are a thief. So when you do these things, you are that. But when you repent and you put your faith and trust in Christ, it says, such were some of you, but you are washed. You are sanctified is the key word here, which is chiazzo, which means to make holy, to set apart. That's the next verse then says, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So we are declared righteous by God. We are justified by God as the Bible says. The Greek word for this is de, de kleo or de, or de, de Dikeo, I could have butchered that, but then you have another word. You have sanctified. Hajiatso. And hajiatso means to make holy and to set apart. So in other words, sanctification, meaning that those who are being saved, as some of the translations say in other places of the Bible, these are people who are in their step, in their faith, are being washed. They are being growing. That's why when you see the parables of the of the faith and the mustard seed it's talking about growing because we are growing and to the point where if you're an Eastern Orthodox you accept a concept of the theosis where you're pretty much becoming like God in a sense but in our understanding we pretty much view sanctification as we're being made uh, distinct and that we don't desire sin and when we keep growing we keep growing we're learning to resist some of these sinful temptations to the point that maybe when we're 60 or 70 years old or such, that we will not want sin. And plus, by the time we get to heaven, we're going to be there in spirit either way. And so when we are there in spirit, not the flesh, meaning not bound down by the hearts of the flesh, which which something I just noted is that she said, that, you know, good-hearted people. There is no such thing as good-hearted people. And the Bible says this, that in the eyes of God, there is no such thing as a good-hearted people because... Psalm 14, 1 says, The fool has says in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is not one that does good. Then you have Romans chapter 3, verse uh, 10 through 11, in which it says the following. As it is written, There is none righteous. There is not one that understands it. There is not one that seeks after God. The verse then continues with, uh, they are all gone out of their way. They, they are together become unprofitable. There is not one that does good. No, not one. So, 
the Bible talks about this. Verse 13 says that their throat is an open sepulchre, as the ESV uh, says. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. And then you also have Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. It says, The heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. Who can understand it? And then a uh, part I'm about to get to in my Bible study at the moment is Isaiah chapter 64. And then Isaiah chapter 64, uh, verse 6. We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So... We cannot rely on our works or try to be these good persons because while it may seem good to us, to God, they don't amount to a hell of beans. What they amount to is simply like a dirty rag trying to clean uh, dirty uh, areas. It's not going to work. That's why you need the blood of Jesus to cleanse you. And that's why putting your faith and trust in him and the work he has done has declared you righteous. For as the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, she then goes on to quote uh, Pope Pius the, um, I want to say 11th, um, noted in Quanto Confessamor More, or however you pronounce it, but it's basically some uh, quote where he says, it is known to us and to you that those who are invincible ignorance of our most holy religion, but who observe the natural carefully the natural law and the precepts graven by God upon the hearts of all men, and who are being disposed to obey God, an honest and upright life, may aided by the light of divine grace attain to eternal life. For God who sees clearly searches the and knows the heart, the disposition thoughts and intentions of each in his supreme mercy and goodness by no means permits that anyone suffer eternal punishment who has not his own free will fallen into sin this is again where people like Pope Pius likes to get away from the scriptures and likes to get away from the Bible because all he cares about is trying to mostly what seems to be some of these Eastern Orthodox and these Roman Catholics try to do is try to appeal to emotions or they try to um, match up with what other people are doing so then it goes on to say, she goes on to conclude, yet those who deny Jesus after being given the opportunity to worship him will not be included in the book of life. This is explained in Matthew chapter 10, where Jesus instructs his 12 apostles to spread his message. He says, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that alone and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, there will be more bearable uh, for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than that town. Then Matthew 10, 32 says, uh, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also uh, acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. In other words, it seems that people of all faiths will be given the opportunity to worship Jesus. However, those who deny Jesus' divinity will be eternally separated from God. So, again, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if you do not put your faith and trust in Christ, um, that you will have eternal punishment to look forward to. You will be um, perished as it will because note what the Bible then says um, about these matters in John 3 16 again it says that you know eternal life is for those who believe in Christ because uh, those who don't because it says they will not perish but have eternal life because those who if that's the case whoever believes will not perish but have eternal life that means the reverse for the opposite which is those who do not believe will not have eternal life but will likewise perish and so when we have then uh, another passage of scripture, I'm trying to remember, I keep remembering it uh, and then forgetting it, but Romans chapter 10, starting at verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and the mouth confesses is made unto salvation. And then Abraham was likewise, was it Abraham? Yes, Abraham was likewise justified by faith. Verse 13 says, Whoever so shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So verse 14, How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Verse 15 says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them who that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. 
So for those who have not heard, it is likely that God can then work in another way to bring about these people, to bring about their salvation. So we don't need to go with this, oh, what about, but what about them that have not heard? Again, there's a good video that's been done on this already from a great brother in Christ. Uh, Chris White is his name. Um, and the video I'll probably l link so that way because it was hard for me to find it uh, originally um, is what about those who have never heard of the gospel um, but it's a uh, he's no longer has his channel that's why it's it's a uh, one of them archive channels that are doing the helping for that um, but it's 26 minutes long and goes over um, a very biblical sola scriptura based approach at dealing with this question um, concerning the problems we have uh, today about this that, you know what about those who have not heard of the gospel uh, before so I would suggest that Miss uh, Thompson SJ here you know gets into sound doctrine I don't know what church the person attends she says she went to a she goes to a southern baptist church but i tell you if she was to be like i'm serious like if they found out what she taught like my church knows some of the things i've already believed in um they could be some pretty interesting uh ideas um but if you're going to then say did you affirm this um and then you have to deal with what the other people say about and for example the Baptist faith and message which is a uh, document proposed concerning these uh, Southern Baptists and what they believe and what they affirm and if you're going to be a part of that you have to affirm what happens and so it says in the tenth section of the Baptist faith and message confession of faith concerning the last things it says quote God in his own time and his own way will bring the world to its appropriate end according to his promise. Jesus Christ will return personally and visibly to glory, in glory to the earth. The dead will be raised and Christ will judge all men in, in righteousness. The unrighteous will be consigned to hell, the place of everlasting punishment. The righteous in their resurrected and glorified bodies will receive their reward and will dwell forever in heaven with the Lord. And then we have the sections where it shows the scripture verses in which they justify their position and where they're getting these verses where they're getting this idea that you know when people die they you know there's eternal punishment and such so I would recommend to read that since if you're gonna be a part of a church that is like this you know you gotta understand where they're getting the doctrine from so be careful in what you affirm and believe because especially when you teach something that goes against the Bible, it's going to hurt your cause when you try to go against atheism. You're claiming you're going to be in this for Christianity, but then you oppose what Christianity itself has taught for quite some years. And this is just one of those things where I wish that you would repent, get right with God, turn to turn your life over to Christ and live. Because while you may people may say that, you know, oh, but she's... Christian she believes again I've said this in the very first of the video I believe we're talking about two different Jesuses and that she is preaching a false gospel and if she she's basically saying let's be lazy about it because if that's the case that if no one's ever heard before let's just do nothing but of course we're commanded to preach the gospel to all kinds of kinds of people and concerning the people that don't hear the gospel God will do with them as they as he wishes and he is just in doing so. For as Romans 9 says, concerning the vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy, not necessarily saying that everyone who has not heard the gospel before is this vessel of wrath that is going to be described, because God can grant mercy on whom he wishes. But listen to the verse. Verse 18. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will hardeneth. They will say, Why doth he find fault? For who has resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Say, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the lump, the same lump to make one vessel unto honor, 
meaning the savior, meaning the saved, meaning the believed, and another to dishonor. What if God, willing to show His wrath? And to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath, fitted for destruction, and that he may make known the riches of the glory of the vessels of mercy which had afore prepared to glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but of the Gentiles as well. So, consider the Bible, consider the words of Scripture, do not consider your own fallacious, man centered reasoning. I would advise this as you examine these issues, and I would recommend that you get more books on this, and that you look at the video that I will be that will be in the description. Um, but concerning early Christianity, concerning what the Bible teaches, there is a hell, there is an eternal punishment that is set forth in this world, and I hope no one goes there, and that's why I preach the gospel. And I hope likewise that you understand what this means and that you get on board with this. So that being said, we're going to end this in prayer. I uh, hope, thank y'all for coming and listening. Um, but uh, hope to see y'all next time. Dear Lord, we thank you for this program. We thank you for this podcast episode. We ask that you hope that you allow the word of God, that allow your word itself to be spoken, to be preached especially with today, that it reach people so that whoever hears it may be affected and may be changed by its words, by its power, and by the effect that it can bring, whether it be for edification, sanctification, justification, or even salvation itself, Lord. May it work in your honor. May you be with the SJ and guide her in all she does. May you grant her wisdom so that she comes to the truth, Lord, in what your word teaches. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.